Did you know that Oregon has roughly 37,000 operating farms and over 100 farmers markets? And that most of these farms, they're operating all year long? It's one of the main reasons so many of our favorite restaurants are able to cook with fresh seasonal ingredients. But how can a non-chef on a budget partake of our winter bounty? On Thursdays, we talk food on CityCast Portland, and today we're talking winter farming with Mary Colombo, co-owner of Wild Roots Farm in Troutdale. And she's been supplying our city with fresh produce since 2009 and is here to answer all of our questions. It's Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. What kind of activity is usually happening at your farm this time of year? Right. What does winter farming look like? Uh, Lots of very cold fingers and (laughs) harvests, but a lot of crops like carrots and potatoes and winter squash are things that we're harvesting in the fall putting in storage. And a lot of our crops are in cold storage, which I think most people just assume like crops are harvested the day before market and come to market. But throughout all grocery stores, most things are harvested and stored for quite a while before they come to this, you know, grocery store, especially in the winter. We are still harvesting things like radicchio and kale from from the field because they can survive those cold temperatures, which is like great for farmers and great to have that revenue in the winter time. Yeah. So what challenges do farms like local farms in the area face during winter? How are you guys surviving? Definitely having a a winter CSA and kind of getting that money up front helps a lot of farmers get through. Um, The fact that Oregon has like seven winter farmers markets helps a lot of farmers kind of be able to keep the lights on during the winter. You mentioned the CSA, which is a community supported agriculture, which is basically like a subscription to a local farm. I've had them. They're freaking awesome. If you can afford them out there, people who are listening, go for it. Yeah, (laughs) I think having high tunnels or indoor growing spaces really helps protect farms. Thankfully, the Pacific Northwest is fairly mild in its winters. Although, you know, we have had several frosts this winter, which are incredibly challenging and have wiped out some of the crops on our farm, but just trying to store stuff as much as possible. How big of a difference can winter weather make? Like we're seeing harsher and harsher winters. Are you guys at all worried? Yeah, the last several winters have been felt harsh and especially this particular winter, like we are coming up on our third like cold snap and temperatures below like well below 30, um, which a lot of crops can't necessarily survive. And, you know, I think there's more farms moving to indoor growing space like greenhouses and high tunnels But, you know, that is a huge cost for farmers. So kind of anything we can grow just in the field is kind of where it's at. But this particular winter, you know, our farm is located in the gorge. We had very high winds and very low temperatures and even crops that should have survived like cabbage and purple sprouting broccoli are just annihilated. Yikes. Yeah. So thinking about, all right, well, like what's more storage vegetables? Because I know that I can stick winter squash and potatoes somewhere safe and keep it kind of protected. So just thinking about more storage. Oh, that makes me sad. I'm sorry. It's like we're turning to the Yukon or something. (laughs) Yes. Um, But I mean, it's not doomsday. You're just like, okay, this occasionally happens. Mm -hmm. It may not happen next year is what I'm hearing. Right. And and that's like uh, part of the fun of farming is it's always constantly changing and different. And it's like, well, this year we could have this and next year could be like totally mild. Who knows? Yeah. When you say fun, you mean like you, you say you mean it like fun like that, not like fun. <laughs> right. It keeps it interesting. You All know, right. like you, you kind of in farming, like you can figure something out and think you know it. And then the next year, the weather's different. And you're like, well, I guess I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Your farm is, is close to the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, what sort of opportunities do like farms that are closer into the cities have than maybe farms that are further out? 
Yeah. Um, just like access to markets, not having to spend so much time in a truck or van getting into Portland. We're about 25 minutes from Portland. You know, if a, a restaurant or, you know, grocery store is like, hey, we need a restock of salad. Like it's easier for us to bring that into the city. And yeah, I think just saving on time and transportation is huge. Gotcha. So your your food is at local restaurants, your veggies. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Where can people find them? Well, right now, you know, it's kind of our, our closed season, but um, we sell to restaurants all over the city. We're excited that Ava Jeans is about to reopen, which has been a huge supporter of ours in the past. Um, Cafe Oli is another wonderful restaurant that is a huge supporter of ours. Um, Coquine has been wonderful supporters of ours and really helped keep our doors open during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, it, all over. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite dish that one of them made with your produce that you were like, oh, I would have never thought of that. That's pretty awesome. Oh, boy, that's a hard question. I think that um, for a short time, my husband worked at one of Ava Jean's sister restaurants, and it really just opened our eyes into like what a salad is. Mm -hmm. And they made this delicious celery salad with like dates and cheese. And I had never thought you could just have a salad with celery in it. And yeah. It was delicious. So I'm imagining that they lengthwise kind of like julienne yeah. it or something. Yeah, it's like chunked up perpendicular to the celery. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, th like thin slices, but still um, coarse enough that it's like got a really great texture and kind of like a delicious vinegary uh, dressing. <sighs> So that good. sounds no, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, I think when you when people find out that you can put cheese in salads, they're like, well, oh, OK, well, all right. Then. <laughs> I mean, that's a great way to enjoy radicchio is yeah. adding cheese. So okay. <laughs> that's a great way to enjoy almost anything, really. Uh, let's take a break here. And when we come back, let's talk about where people can find fresh local winter produce. So where can people generally find fresh local produce at this time of year? I mean, I know there's some year long farmers markets, uh, but a lot of people just don't have access to that or just, you know, aren't farmers markets people. I don't know. Like, what are you suggesting? Right. So if you can't go to the farmers market, which I understand, you know, has limited hours, could be hard to drive to. Joining a winter CSA, which usually um, signups for that are in like September, October for most small farms in the area. There are a few grocery stores throughout Portland that also stock winter vegetables from local farms, um, cooperative grocery stores. Does our local Safeway or those big chain like Fred Meyer also carry local farmers? Or are they doing more of the, the trucks are coming in and they're bringing in the veggies? Right. So most large grocery stores, unfortunately, don't really have the capacity to support small local farms. It's just pretty complicated. So they need pretty large quantities. So in general, you kind of have to go to a cooperative or um, like a smaller grocery store to find local produce. Some new seasons do prioritize buying from local small farms. It's generally not everything they have in stock. It'll be a couple items, but I do know some of my farmer friends sell to new seasons. Cool. And the reason I'm asking these really like involved questions is because there's some people out there who can't afford it, you know? And so I'm just like, what is the hack, Mary, <laughs> for fresh <laughs> produce <laughs> when you can't afford a CSA and you can't get to a farmer's market? I guess that's it, right? Those right. Are, that's it. And that's like an unfortunate gap in our local food system. Yeah. CSAs are a very large upfront cost. Um, you can purchase CSAs with um, SNAP. The Pacific Northwest CSA Coalition is helping most small farms be able to sign up with SNAP. Um, That's great. But outside of that, yeah, farmers markets are hard to access for a lot of people. Yeah. 
So you can go to a farmer's market, use your SNAP, get some fresh veggies, which is really cool. I didn't know that. Right. And at most farmer's markets, they have grants that if you go with your SNAP card and you go up to the market booth, you can also access Double Up Food Bucks, which is basically free money. Um, wow. So at uh, Oregon City Farmer's Market, they had a grant a while back that you got like 30 bucks free. And at Winter Market, it was amazing because a lot of the produce is a little bit out of people's comfort zone. It's not mm-hmm. like broccoli or spinach. It's fennel and radicchio. And it kind of allowed people to experiment with shopping local winter produce. Yeah, perfect transition, Mary, because what (laughs) sort of local vegetables are available in the winter in Oregon? Because I know we get most of our lettuces in the winter from California. So tell me what's native to Oregon in the winter. I mean, I think most people are surprised that we can, in Oregon, grow throughout the winter season. Most people are pretty shocked when I tell them we're still farming in January. Um... So from like, I don't know, November through March, um, which is kind of Oregon's winter season, everything from fennel, cabbage, kohlrabi, lots of winter storage roots. Like it's actually still pretty abundant period, you know, potatoes, Mm -hmm. winter squash. um, It's definitely a little bit more challenging and not quite some of those like sexy vegetables everybody loves, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Tell tomatoes me about this. and peppers. <laughs> <Gotcha>. but <laughs> That's hilarious. So you, you mentioned radicchio. Um, mm-hmm. Is that native to Oregon or was it brought here and then like uh, kind of crossbred to grow here? I'm just curious. Right. So radicchio is from the Veneto region of Italy. It's something that they have been cultivating since like the 40s and 50s. And all of our radicchio seed basically in the United States comes from Italy. But it grows really well here in Washington because we're kind of at that same latitude as the Veneto region in Italy. Interesting. So I heard, I don't know if this is a fact, but I heard from someone of Italian descent that uh, Italians find the way that we eat radicchio uh, a little odd because we tend to eat it raw and they're just like, that's weird. You're supposed (laughs) to cook it because if you eat it raw, it's really bitter. I heard that. I was like, is that why I don't like radicchio? You know, (laughs) I mean, what what do you say to that, Mary? Um, That's kind of my understanding from having traveled in Italy and kind of having relationships with a lot of Italian radicchio growers is that they don't necessarily use it in salad, but a lot of times they will grill it, um, add it to risotto, uh, find ways in which to eat it either warmed um, and not just necessarily throwing it into a salad and it's specifically not the red one that's the most bitter that is found in most bag salad greens. <laughs> gotcha. Wait, so there's different kinds of radicchio? There are uh, a lot of different types of radicchio. Okay. I know um, <laughs> <laughs> there are about eight or nine different varieties. And so I feel like for most people's aversion to radicchio kind of traces back to the fact that there's much better radicchio out there. Gotcha. <laughs> Maybe they should try a local radicchio is what exactly. I'm hearing. Exactly. What do you have to say, like, to the people who are just like, look, all I know are sexy vegetables. <laughs> I just know these hot tomatoes, <laughs> <laughs> these really cool cucumbers. I don't know where I'm going. I'm sorry. <laughs> but what do we do with this local, with this winter lettuce, with this squash, mm-hmm. with these root veggies in the winter? Like, is there a place that someone can go to and like, get recipes or tips or anything? Right. For great tips, I believe the website's still up, uh, Eat Winter Vegetables, but also Cook With What You Have um, is an amazing resource. Uh, We use it for all of our CSA members. Mm -hmm. Um, But just like cookbooks, like Six Seasons is a really great resource. Grist. Asking farmers when you're shopping at the farmer's market, like, hey, how do I cook this winter squash? Because Mm -hmm. most of us are eating with all our own produce. Mm -hmm. Um, But where to start with radicchio? Like the green ones that you'll find at the farmer's market are a lot more mild. 
And also during this time of year, radicchio is just more mild in general because winter vegetables produce more sugars in the winter to kind of survive frosts. Okay, let's so, say that again. Winter yes. vegetables produce more sugars to survive. Mm-hmm. I have never, that's crazy. So we've just been like ignoring all this floor candy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so much floor candy. Yeah. Um, they call it like, antifreeze, plant antifreeze, but basically they increase the the sugar amounts so that they can survive through the winter frost, which is pretty amazing. And that's why like eating kale in the winter, it's so much sweeter than kind of like a kale during the summer or why radicchio harvested in February in Oregon is going to be so much better than something coming from California in like August. Okay, this is a pretty important question. Kiss, Mary, kill. Arugula, kale, radicchio. Oh, let's see. Kiss arugula. You're going to kiss arugula. Mary, radicchio. Of course. And we're done with kale. Come on. Wow. <laughs> you heard it here. Mary is giving kale the boot. Goodbye, kale. It, you've had your moment in the sun. Let's let's let the light shine on Radicchio. (laughs) (laughs) And now for your microdose of news. The latest data shows that Portland is lagging in its post-2020 financial recovery. The pandemic caused a huge drop in employment, but unlike other similarly sized cities like Austin or Salt Lake, Portland didn't return to 2019 employment levels until July of last year. Local economists speculate that one big reason is that our downtown, unlike other cities, is centered on office buildings and not residential areas, meaning as more downtown workers continued telecommuting, surrounding businesses took the hit. And lawmakers are considering new legislation to make life easier on Ukrainian refugees living in Oregon. There are more than 4,500 of them in the state, and Democrat Senator James Manning Jr. of Eugene wants to give them more support for securing housing and obtaining a driver's license. For even more local news and events, sign up for our daily newsletter, Hey Portland. We'll throw a link in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend or leave us a review. It really does help us out. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's.